Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to ICAR's annual meeting. This is our second day. Uh, we are very excited to be back with you on uh, this Wednesday morning or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, I'm just going to quickly, my name is David McCain. I'm the deputy director at ICAR. I'm just going to quickly do a couple of housekeeping notes uh, and then turn it over to our uh, very exciting first discussion this morning. The um, the housekeeping notes are very simple. We're going to post a, a document in the chat uh, that has some technical uh, tips and, and tricks if you're having trouble. If you are having trouble, it has a contact email for uh, how to get in touch with the ICAR staff who are running the tech, as well as our, our outside assistants uh, from Jenna and Dylan. So uh, there shouldn't be any reason, uh, hopefully, that the, the tech doesn't work for you. And, um, and other than that, uh, I think everybody should be logged in and ready to get started. So I want to kick this morning off by just saying uh, thank you very much to our panelists who are about to hear from. The discussion we're about to hear is going to be moderated uh, by Kathy Feingold, who uh, probably everybody who's joining us today knows is just an out, you know, a, a pillar in the in the labor movement and an absolutely um, unwavering supporter and friend of ICARS and has been so for for many years. And so she's going to be leading a discussion um, amongst many people with, uh, you know, looking at a lot of the things that we need to be thinking about in terms of the intersection between corporate accountability and labor and, um, and, and provide us with a global perspective um, from a number of, of just really outstanding speakers. So uh, with that, I'm going to kick it over to Kathy, who um, I'm really excited to hear from. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone here in the United States. Good afternoon, and perhaps good evening um, for those of you joining from other places. As David said, my name is Kathy Feingold. I'm the International Director at the AFL-CIO, the U.S. Labor Federation here in the United States. I am also um, the Deputy President of the International Trade Union Confederation, the global labor body. But for today's purpose, I'm most proud to say I'm also a board member of ICAR, this fantastic organization. Um, and today we really wanted to look at the intersection of building a just transition for climate and worker activists and trying to really look at models that are being built as we speak. Um, as you may have heard before, the global labor movement often says there are no jobs on a dead planet. And I must say, sitting here in the United States right now, this phrase really rings true as we have wildfires in California, we have hurricanes hitting us, we have record temperatures uh, we're experiencing, and that's just here in the United States. I know around the world, uh, every country has a story about how climate is impacting uh, workers and their communities. And over the years, there's been many conversations between climate and worker rights activists, not only about our frustrations, but about the bridges that we need to build together um, to make sure that our movements work together to effectively address climate change, as well as the need for decent work in our communities and for racial justice. It's not either or, and all the people in this conversation today know that. We need to be building these bridges together. We need strategies that recognize the interwovenness of the crises. So we've got lots of crises, and challenges, but I also want to say today we're here to talk about opportunities. We all know the challenges, the growing inequality, climate crisis, pandemic, the job loss. Um, I don't know if people have seen the latest global numbers, almost a half a billion job losses just due to the pandemic. That's just the formal economy, 1.6 billion informal economy jobs. This is such an enormous crisis. So we have to look at these crises together. There's the racial um, injustices happening and attacks on our democracy. So with all of that, we also have this moment of opportunity and that's what this panel is about, re-envisioning economic models that work for all of us, figuring out how we build models that are both put the well-being of workers in the center as well as the well-being uh, of climate. So we're going to look at this framework of just transition today, building the actual models that will work to address climate change and the needs of working people and to build our new vision together. So let's jump right into this panel. Um, first, we have a great transatlantic panel today. Uh, we have Samantha Smith, who is the executive director of the International Trade Union Confederation's Just Transition Center. 
Kaya Chatterjee, Executive Director of the United States Climate Action Network. Jan Philipp Rhodes, a senior advisor of the DGB, which is the German Labor Federation. Jesper Lund Larsen, political advisor at the United Federation of Danish, Danish Workers 3F. We're gonna begin with a few questions and then really I hope to turn it out uh, around to all of you um, for your questions, your challenges, your thoughts on how we move forward together. So I wanna first turn to um, Samantha Smith and if you could just talk a bit about your work with the International Trade Union Confederation and the Just Transition Center you lead and talk about what is just transition. This may not be a term that's familiar to everyone. Um, so what does it mean to the labor movement? Sam. Yeah. Thanks so much, Kathy, and uh, good morning or afternoon or evening, as the case may be. I'm very excited to talk about this. So first of all, I, I work for ITUC, which is the global federation for most of the world's unions. We represent more than 200 million organized working people in 162 countries. And uh, ITUC established a just transition center in the aftermath of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and also the negotiation in the UN of global rules for just transition, which were negotiated between governments, employers, and unions under the ILO. And we're not a think tank, we're a, we're a sort of resource center or do tank for, um, we, work, we work for our affiliates, we work for workers, and we help unions and their allies get good plans on just transition. Um, so that can be everything from helping unions get into position for a collective bargaining agreement or for nas a national law, regulations, a city or a state plan, or a sector or a sector agreement. It just really depends on what, the, what, what, our, what our affiliates, what their members want. Um, just transition is is really two things i would say both as a practitioner and then also under this sort of set of, of global rules um first first it's all the things that governments and employers need to do if you're going to radically change or even phase out a high emitting industry right so it is about bringing down emissions consistent with for example the paris agreement and that can be um one a plan for every worker which we'll hear about from jan i'm sure um it should be a plan for the region and community which often involves like uh, investment in infrastructure and in jobs across the economy including care jobs um and it involves also just transition in the form of collective bargaining with the company or the industry that is changing or even actually actually shutting down. So bridge to pension, retrain, retain, redeploy workers in the company. But then the part of just transition that we don't talk about so much, we're usually thinking about like coal workers, what's gonna happen with that. We don't think about the new jobs because one of the things that we really do see is that many of the new green jobs, they're shitty jobs. And uh, it's really essential that the new jobs are good jobs with labor rights, with security of contract, good wages and conditions. Um, so often when we're working with when we're working with unions on just transition, we might be working across both of these dimensions at once in the same geographical area, or we might just be working on one dimension, for example, in the offshore wind industry, trying to get the companies there to clean up their supply chains so that all everyone who's employed by subcontractors is getting a good job while building the energy system of the future. We, um, one last thing about what we do, which might explain like some of the things I'll say in this discussion. So we're working only with unions in high emitting sectors, right? So uh, mining, especially coal, power sector, including renewables, manufacturing, including auto, transport, construction, and now actually some agriculture, steel, cement, so on. And so um, unlike, you know, other parts of the labor movement that are super, super mobilized already on climate change, you see ways forward. Like our job is to help the workers whose jobs really are on the line to find solutions. Because one big learning from Just Transition is that if, if your only option um, in the face of climate action is to be unemployed and maybe get benefits if you're lucky, 
you're going to fight like hell to keep the job that you have. But our experience is that when solutions are on the table and unions are at the table, we're negotiating solutions and there are real solutions for workers, people's views change really radically because they too also want solutions. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. And, I, uh, and that's a great frame. And we're going to hear um, two examples of that, of real solutions on the table um, from Denmark and, and Germany. But first, I want to go to Kea about what does just transition mean, you know, for the U.S. Um, climate movement? How is this used as a framework to think about building um, across movements? And um, how have you seen some of this come into your own work? Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Um, and also want to give a good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone out there. Um, I, you know, there's, there's a even broader definition of just transition that I think comes into play for a lot of our member organizations. So US Climate Action Network is this big network of organizations in the US. And of course, we have an international colleagues in Can Europe and Can International as well. And for a lot of our members, just transition is really more than about workers transitioning. It's also about uh, addressing the many workers who've been left out of the labor movement and are in our communities and are being affected by the impacts of climate change right now and have been affected by the impacts of pollution for a long time in their communities. So, so you guys know in the United States we have massive disproportionate uh, effects of pollution on black and brown communities and indigenous communities and, and th those folks who've been affected by pollution also see themselves as part of a just transition, a transition to a fair society where everyone has access to a good job, including people who are currently in unions, where everyone has access to clean air, including people, uh, no matter where you live or, 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 you know, or what your working status is. And so, so that broader definition comes into play a lot for us, that we need to transition to a world where literally everyone is taken care of and where we are coming from a common sense in this country, unfortunately, where it's like everyone for themselves, everyone needs to take care of themselves. And that common sense has been set by this alignment in this country of like white nationalists and oligarchs and you know people who want us to be in a constant state of war and and people who really just don't want very anyone to have power if they're not you know a very typical white heterosexual man and that alignment is to me what a just transition takes out of play uh, we say, no, those people can't have power anymore. They can't define our common sense. Our common sense is that we take care of each other as a community, regardless of, of what our zip code is or, or where we live. And so, so that broader definition really drives us to, to look at this current situation we're in right now and say, like, we, you know, we, you know, all those crises you were outlining, Kathy, we need to get out of these together as a society by creating a ton of jobs, uh, dealing, you know, tightening up the labor market, creating as many jobs as we can, having the right to organize, the right to unionize really, really protected in our country, but also doing that in a way that deals with the fact that we are out of time on the climate crisis. We are already suffering. And today, right now, we can't spend any money uh, that that doesn't create a job and get us out of this crisis because it's a massive societal transformation, not only to dismantle the, these systems of oppression that brought us the climate crisis, but at the same time deal with recovery from COVID and dismantling white supremacy and racial injustice, which, uh, which for us is really interrelated with the climate crisis because we don't really think we would have a climate crisis if all these exploding pipelines and polluting factories had to go in rich white neighborhoods. I don't even think that would have happened. Uh, and so these issues, these crises are deeply intertwined for us. Um, and, and we see a path forward together right now in this moment where we can really be taking care of each other. Thanks, Kara. I love the idea that just transitions is expansive um, view and the fact that it, it, as I was trying to say at the beginning, it, it's, I think, a framework that presents a lot of opportunities right now for absolutely rethinking the economic model that has created uh, these conditions and that this can be really transformative in, in this moment of crisis. Um, I want to go um, to Denmark um, and then we'll come to, to Germany. Yes, for in Denmark, over the last 30 years, Denmark has been transitioning from coal to oil to a strong um, wind uh, industry. How is just transition understood there? How have you been using this framework in Denmark? Well, first of all, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, we, we, first of all, I had to say, we, 
and uh, that's my union had been working with uh, green transition for uh, the last 30 years. Uh, the, the policy about uh, raising windmills in, in Denmark starting in the basement in our cellar together with our Minister of Environment because he was a social democrat and he had close contact to the trade union in Denmark and therefore we could s together see that there was a lot of possibility for job creation and that was because we could also see that it was important we had a lot of people who was unemployed and we had to find out how we could help them so that's the reason why we start to focus on this one. And then, because I've been here since uh, the end of 18, I have been uh, working very, very uh, many years with the Green Transition. And we have changed more and more. So in, we started with a focus on a lot of uh, work environment and then the environment. And now it's Green Transition because we want to uh, focus on all things at the same time also what kind of uh, training skills and education do you need so you are ready for the next job? And it's very important for us that we also have a, a social dialogue, a social dialogue both with the government, with the uh, uh, business partners, with the companies and so on. And we can see today, because still the social dialogue is more than 100 years tradition in Denmark, so it's not very easy when I said we just do so and so and so. It's because we had a long tradition for, for working together with this one. But it also means that together with the business organization and the companies, we can go to our government and say it's very important that we are now changing, for example, that we close down uh, the oil production in Denmark. But before we do that one, we must have a political agreement that we will, for example, build uh, more windmill farms, or we will focusing on the bioeconomy, which will be the next one where we can create uh, billions of jobs in this one. And be, as we have a political agreement about that one, then we can close down the, the oil uh, production and the gas production. And I think that is one of the biggest problems in different countries. If I'm focusing on Poland, if they could take an agreement there, the uh, employers, the uh, workers, the government, that we will now uh, educate and train people so they can have a job in about five years, another job, and then you can close down the, the, wind, uh, the coal mines. As I remember right, you have done a, a little bit similar in Michigan, where you have uh, folks in that the coal miners there could uh, starting in a job in the, the windmill sector. So before they close down the coal mine, they will have train and educate people there. And very often it's not a, a, a long education they need. It's maybe four or five weeks or maybe four or five months if they, they had to, uh, to be an industry workers. But the, the driver is still the driver and, and so on. There's a lot of things where you just can tell people that this is very important and we can help you and we will do this one because we can then see that we both secure job for people. We get them uh, a little bit prouder because they have a kind of education and we could also take care of the climate so we can be sure that we also uh, in about the next hundred years and thousand years had uh, an earth where we can live on. So I think that is what I will start with. Thank you. Thank you. And you've brought up a few key points before I turn to Jan, you know, from Germany. Um, this notion of needing trust, and we can talk about that. That's a huge issue <laughs> in the United States. The workers don't trust these moments of transition, whether it was because of trade policies, when factories close, we have issues of trust. And then I wanted to just flag for especially um, my US colleagues on the call, what is this social dialogue? It is a very labor term that is very European labor term in particular. <laughs> we don't have very much in the US. So it's a key component of just transition, um, which you've identified because it gets to this issue of trust. It is a model by which um, workers, unions, employers, and government and civil society come together 
to develop the plans and they have trust in coming together and negotiating um, instead of it being a zero sum, which is often the case in the US where everyone's coming at each other. It's an actual um, system of working together um, that has really helped many countries, uh, especially in Europe, achieve just transition. So I just want to point out that trust and social dialogue are two really important ingredients that the labor movement has been using in other countries to develop these models. But Jan, we know that Germany, you have great systems of social dialogue and the co-determination. Tell us a little bit, um, your, your story is a little more recent. You're in this moment of trying to um, get out of, of coal by I believe 2038. Um, you've been in a, a process, a multi-stakeholder social dialogue process. Tell us about the German story. So, a good afternoon, or I would say hello to everyone from Germany. Uh, I'm Jan, I work for the German Trade Union Confederation. We represent uh, 6 million workers across all sectors in Germany, from the public sector to mining, so industry, uh, teachers, so more or less all sectors are covered um, under the umbrella of the German Trade Union Confederation. So, as you can see, we have a huge debate within our uh, trade union movement coming from all sides. Um, of industries, public services, and so on. Um, I would like to start um, to referring to you, Casey. You said um, there are no jobs on the dead planning, I, I, on a dead planet. I think it was um, Sharon Burrow who said this phrase. And to be more positive, um, we are using right now the term that we need decent jobs on a living planet. So um, to underline the chances uh, we see in the transition. Um, as Jasper already said, um, that uh, transition processes aren't new for us. So uh, we see, of course, uh, decarbonization, but we're also facing challenges coming from digitalization, automatization, um, the um, demographic um, change within our communities. So there are a lot of um, drivers for transformation uh, we are facing right now, and the top decarbonization is just one part of it. So uh, it's good to, to keep that in mind that um, a lot of a lot of is going on with, with the economy and also um, with workers. So um, let me say something about our approach uh, on just transition. Uh, we identified more or less four uh, main points uh, coming from just transition. The first one was that uh, workers are really key to the transitions. Uh, they are on the ground, they know um, the company's best and they have the innovation power to really transform the economy and uh, to um, um, push for decarbonization. So it's very key for us uh, to bring the voice of workers at the table and, and that's, uh, you said it, the social dialogue, it's also a very, very German um, approach uh, coming up together with um, the employers, with solutions, so workers and employers uh, together um, in a social dialogue. And therefore, we need um, the concept of uh, co-determination, collective bargaining as a trusted partner within, uh, within the industrial relations we have. So, so the first point, of course, uh, workers are at the table. And the other point for us, uh, which is really important, is that uh, nobody's left behind. So we already heard it, that a lot of uh, groups are are facing the challenges of transition and for us it's very important to bring all these actors together at the table. You call it a social dialogue, we would say a multi-stakeholder approach uh, to really hear all voices coming from the environmentalists, coming from um, scientists, but also coming from, from trade unions and other groups. So um, that's very important for us to, uh, to get in touch with all these groups. Um, what we are lobbying for in the German context is that uh, there's a, a political framework for the transition. So that uh, the transition is not left to the market. Um, um, because what we see right now, I think across uh, the world, especially coming from the pandemic, that um, uh, the markets are very um, blind to, to risk of social and environmental uh, issues. And we see a lot of dumping here. So it needs a strong, strong framework uh, coming from, from um, um, the state, but also um, com combined with some social dialogue and a multi-stakeholder approach. And the last uh, point of, 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 of this picture of, of just transition, which of course is broadness, is uh, we need investments. We need investment in, the, in all traditional branches. Um, 
you already talked about uh, the opportunities for new jobs, uh, but, but, but we also see, and Sam already said it, that in um, uh, the new sectors and new jobs are mostly uh, have lower, um, lower quality when it comes to, to decent jobs. And for us, it's very important that we, have, that we find solutions of transition within the companies, within the old uh, uh, sectors, uh, to really transform them. Uh, but not only um, investments there, uh, we, we also uh, heavily investments, um, especially in uh, climate friend friendly uh, infrastructures for uh, buildings and for mobility. So I will give you a short insight about the German um, coal commission. But what we see uh, is that the next steps are to decarbonize the mobility sector, the heavy industries. So I think we're, we're facing a lot of challenges uh, coming in the next year. So it's not only the energy sector. Um, so let me give you a short insight what we discussed uh, the last two years. So starting in 2018, um, um, uh, the German government decided to put uh, a multi-stakeholder multi platform together, um, inviting a lot of actors. So there were 31 members coming from, from several um, um, sectors, from uh, uh, companies, from uh, businesses, from um, scientists, environmentalists. So all actors come together and negotiated over more than a half year uh, to come up with robust solutions to really decarbonize um, uh, the energy sector and especially phasing out of, 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 of coal mining. And in Germany, we have a long tradition of, of coal mining. So uh, it is also at our, our really heart of trade units in Germany uh, that the coal mining is, um, is uh, highly related to, to our members and to, to traditional understanding of trade unions. So uh, it was even for, for trade union and um, uh, a way to, to rethink of uh, rethinking uh, of our understanding what, what we really want and how we, how we can face the challenges. But it was an, a really good um, process uh, for trade union as well because we really um, uh, get in touch with our members, get in touch with our affiliates and came up with solutions. And um, let me give you an insight uh, what, we, what, we, what you find of solutions um, very short or Good. Maybe so the next round? round? Yeah, next round, I'll come to you solutions. Okay, perfect, perfect, great. fine. No, no, you, this is great because I think what you've set up is you need a political framework. The market doesn't have the solution. This is to Kea's point. We need a totally different economic uh, model that we're trying to build. So political framework and then, um, you know, really um, uh, look, making sure that workers are at the table. So you've set up and, and having that just transition process. And then I want to come to, cause, to you in the next round about Germany's very concrete solutions for workers, which is how you got them out of, you know, the coal mines. Um, so let's go to round um, two. Um, just really, um, Sam, you know, we've already started to hear the, some of the key strategies you kind of get to see beyond um, Germany and Denmark, because some people in the US will say, well, these are countries with strong, you know, social dialogue traditions. What are some other practices you see around the world around um, just transition? And what are, what are key things that, that go into a good, strong model? Yeah, thanks, Kathy. No, it's good because it. Uh, I think it also helps to unpack a bit this, uh, you know, like what what this definition of just transition, right? So we, I mean, right now we're working a lot with uh, unions in South Africa, Brazil. We just started working with unions in Indonesia, India, Colombia. We have a sort of longer running effort with unions in Nigeria. Um, in addition to the, you know, the great cooperation with the sisters and brothers in our in our European affiliates, the Canadians, also the U.S. Um, so just to just to highlight an aspect of just transition that we haven't talked about a lot, but we really do need to talk about it. And I was thinking about this yesterday during the Climate Jobs New York Summit. I mean. A big part of just transition is what we would in sort of trade union euro speak call social protection. So that's income support. So it's unemployment insurance. It's just cash payments to poor people, which are like a critical part of responses from trade unions, things we're arguing for in Brazil and South Africa and India and other places like cash payments to poor people in the informal economy, so people who starve to death during lockdowns and during this gigantic jobs apocalypse that, that we're living through. It's healthcare, 
you know, so it's not just access to healthcare, but actually that people are getting healthcare, everyone. It's education, it's abundant and ideally free public services. So it's the range of things that might, for people from the US, fall under the, you know, fall into the bucket of the welfare state, but um, is also, you know, a lot of these are fundamental human rights, right? Like right to healthcare, right to clean water, all of these things, along with labor rights. And so, um, so when so when we are when we're working in other countries, like good practices are one. You have to have the foundation in place, and that foundation is actually social protection. Because, um, for example, in South Africa right now, they're looking down the barrel of forty plus percent unemployment, right? And in that context, if you have a job right now, you're clinging to that job with both hands, right? And if you and if you go out into unemployment, there is almost nothing for you. So, um, so it this system of social protection for everyone, but you know also for people who become unemployed is really critical. So to take away uh, some of the fears that people have about feeding their families and and uh, staying afloat, especially during this crisis. Um, I think another thing that's really key is. Um, is actually that people have fundamental labor rights. Now we see, just to sort of take away some illusions about the labor movement, you know, people organize even when it's illegal for them to do so, right? So informal workers will organize and we have inf associations of informal workers who are working on just transition. Um, but it is having fundamental labor rights, um, including the right to collectively bargain is really helpful. Um, but even like in Brazil, where that is, you know, there's no social dialogue with the coup government, there's no social dialogue with the employers because they're aligned with the government. Nonetheless, you know, the unions, our affiliate coup Brazil is finding a way to, um, to try to set up systems of social dialogue with governors in, in states that, uh, that are aligned more with the, more with the interests of labor. Um, some other things that are good practices in just transition. I mean, I think sometimes in the US there's an idea that, um, okay, unions, we're only bargaining for our workers, right? So it's only the people who are our members, but actually we think everybody should be a union member. And if we're really going to do something meaningful about climate change, all the trade unionists and gay are like, yes, if we're gonna do something meaningful about climate change, we're not just talking about the 25,000 people, as Jan said, who are directly employed in coal in Germany, we're talking about the whole auto sector. We're talking all jobs and all sectors. So from our perspective, when we're at the table with the government or with employers, we're bargaining for everyone, for good jobs, for everyone. And we're also looking in transition plans, not only for people to move from, let's say, coal mining to copper mining, but we're looking for decent jobs in green construction, which is also you know, really important and good fit for people who, who, have, who today are working in coal mining. So whole of economy approach, um, good, the more union density you have, the better, but uh, labor rights are a great start. I mean, one thing Jesper hasn't mentioned is Denmark has 70% union density. So it's no problem to talk to the government actually, because if they don't talk to you, you can shut their stuff down. And um, other things, social protection is really key. And then also maybe having these two frameworks that Jan talked about. One is social dialogue, which is a very specific thing uh, for us in Europe. We get kind of shirty about it. You know, it's got to be only this. But that's always like unions, governments, and employers. Sometimes, in, as in South Africa, it includes communities. But then also having this really like deep and robust engagement with other stakeholders, which would be communities and civil society. I mean, I think I'll stop there. I have some more specific examples, but I, I bet other people do too. That's really helpful. And I always realize we need two hours for this conversation, which we don't have. Um, so I'm gonna go to, to Kea because I liked, uh, you know, um, uh, Samantha was talking about some of these tools that the labor movement traditionally uses, right? Collective bargaining. And one of the things that's really caught my attention over the years is, you know, how um, the US climate and the global climate 
um, movement has been um, both um, thinking of using some of the labor movement's um, tools from strike action, withholding um, work. Um, Want to talk, how are you thinking about your strategies in this current moment of, of crisis, um, um, both from, you know, the, the climate strike actions um, that have been happening, but I just also want to flag, you know, I've seen the climate movement stepping up around supporting um, legislation like the HEROES Act, which is in the U.S., the um, package that's needed for unemployment insurance to Samantha's um, point about social protection. How are you envisioning how climate comes to the table, you know, to build this relationship with labor? Yeah, I mean, we're in a moment in the U.S. where we really need a united front. Uh, and, and that united front has to be across a range of people who have suffered injustices and are ready to rise up. Um, and there are a lot of us in this country who have suffered injustices and are ready to rise up. And of course, we've talked about in the context of the climate crisis, people are literally sifting through the ashes of what was their home. People are pulling their family portraits out that are so water damaged from hurricane after hurricane. And then we have, and, and, and you have all of these injustices, they, they pile up on each other and they tend to be concentrated in particular places, not by coincidence, but by design. Uh, th this country has been set up to hurt very particular people and very particular places. People who are, you know, people have been made vulnerable. It is not, it is not just some weird coincidence that we don't have union density in this country. It is not some weird coincidence that the very same places that are hit by hurricanes and fires are, are, are places where people already had asthma. It's not a coincidence that people dying of COVID are predominantly black, brown, and indigenous. People have been made vulnerable. And it is only through a united front that we can undo that damage that has been done, that we can pass anti-racist policy, that we can pass just policy, and we can come together around that. Um, but, but again, I mean, like the, the, the thing is that like, it's, it's, it's hard work because there are, there are places where, where we come into tension with each other across these basic human rights. We, I mean, we can all sit here and agree that we have a human right to clean air. We have a human right to clean water. We have a human right to work with dignity. But then there are moments when, you know, when, when, when tensions come into play and, and, these, and, and that's the reality of our situation is that it is hard to create a united front when, when lives are at stake um, and, and, and people are losing their homes. And so I do want to highlight that we just put out this, um, this Thrive Resolution um, in, in the House and Senate, um, has hundreds of groups supporting it, uh, nearly 100 people in, in the Congress and Senate, many, many labor unions and many environmental groups, many social justice groups. And, and that's really what we're trying to assert in the Thrive Agenda is, is to establish this united front so that we can be in solidarity because we are really trying to learn from the tactics and successes of a long history of social justice organizing, including in the labor movement. And, and we have to have solidarity. And so I'm just gonna end by reading the first line of the Thrive Resolution. So, so folks get an understanding of like, what is it that we want? Like we, the first line is, whereas families, communities throughout the United States share hopes and dreams of a good life that is free from worry about meeting basic needs with reliable and fulfilling work, a dignified and healthy standard of living and the ability to enjoy time with loved ones. That's a really universal thing. That's what we want and we have to be united to get it, but it's not gonna be easy because we simply disagree on certain things like nuclear, like carbon capture and storage. I can go on and on, but we just disagree about what is just for, for our people and, how, and, and what are the human rights that most need to be protected. Thanks, Kaya. And so I, I love um, hearing that first line out of the Thrive legislation, again, centering policies that are about the well-being of fa working families, dignity, as well as climate. Like, how do we get there? How do we find that common ground? Despite having um, challenges over, you know, some of the other pieces, I do think there's a lot of common ground there, um, especially with that frame that you've just put forward. Um, I'm going to go um, to Jesper and Jan to kind of um, uh, tell us specifically what is it that helped build that bridge, that transition that happened in Denmark, that transition that hap that's happening, I would say, in Germany right now? Um, you know, how you have this wind industry, yes, where you're talking about going into other sectors, about continuing to, to build this in Denmark. 
what is it? What are some of the policies that have um, built this trust and gotten workers um, to move into these other industries? And where where you have about uh, you each have about a few minutes on this one. Yes, thanks. <laughs> um, yes, first of all, as you also mentioned earlier, that it's about trust that we trust each other. But it's also to uh, show that if we are working together, then we, the companies will have growth and the workers will have a job. So it's a win-win situation for uh, both parties. But also for uh, export, it's very important that we can do things because we are a small country. We, we uh, can only uh, produce things that we can export. But on involving the workers, as I also have right on the chat, is that this year we have a collective agreement with the industry, and industry is broad, it includes the metal industry, food industry, etc. That it's now they must involve the workers in reducing the energy in the companies uh, and so on. And, and it shows that we think in, in the same way that we can help each other to, to uh, uh, grow the company and uh, making things cheaper if we are focusing on, on the same thing so we can still also have a, a high salary because that is also what we have in Denmark. And it shows that it's, it is uh, possible to have a, a high income and the company can grow and they can export and so on. But it's also because again that uh, we as a trade union had uh, not uh, are fighting always against uh, our company. We have said how can we find an agreement? How can we, uh, the uh, farmers organization, which we always are fighting against because they are, are paying uh, uh, less salary to a lot of uh, people from other countries. But uh, last week they come to, to my boss and said, oh, do you think we can make something together so we can reduce the CO2 emission in the agriculture sector and then uh, make a proposal to the government so we still can export 90-95% of the food we are producing in Denmark. So they have an interest in also involving their workers. So they know that we now have the possibility still to be one of the best in, in the, the world to produce things, but also take care of the climate. Because if we don't do that one, then we also know that something will happen in the future and, and there will be stronger rules from the government and so on. And they, they of course, they try to be a little bit forward for our government so they don't get a lot of legislation saying you now have to do so and so and so. And then we try to spread it out also to the European Union. So it's not only in Denmark, but it's the European Union laws that we now. And when, uh, and, uh, a lot of time I have been invited uh, both by uh, Sam and uh, ETUC to uh, uh, have speeches in different countries about what we are doing. And I always talk about how good we are and so on. But some, suddenly I find out maybe I was in a too high level. So I start to say, if you start in your own little village, build a small biogas uh, power station, then you can slowly uh, grow this industry and, and then you can do a lot of things both in the local area, but also in, in, in the broader area. And then means that you can create a lot of local jobs. And this is what we are focusing on, that we in the, in the, uh, uh, or in the uh, uh, countryside, we need to, to create jobs. And that is what we can also see if we are focusing on, on new things as uh, the bioeconomy, for example, or if we also are focusing on automatization and robotization and so on, then we can create a lot of new jobs in uh, the uh, 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 countryside and so on. And it's important because it's, it's uh, on these places there is a lot of unemployed people. And I think it's, it's important not to be afraid for, for what's happening in the future, but thinking we can do something as Jan also was saying earlier. Thank you. Thank you. And I think you're bringing up a really important point about if we don't think about it now, the political and economic ramifications are just going to continue to get worse. Uh, those of us in the US, we're about 40 something days out to our election. There are real economic and political ramifications of these crises not being effectively addressed. Um, so let me turn to Jan. You know, what's really interesting about Germany is 
you know, there's not a one size fits all for just transition. You have workers, we heard from Jesper, you know, agricultural workers, local people in small businesses. So you need to have policies that address, you know, pensioners and um, uh, people who are just starting their careers. How did you get to this um, to convince all of these people that it was time for a transition? Wow. Oh. I think we're still in the process to convince all our members. But uh, let me start with um, our um, experience we made, we made with the Coal Commission. So it started in 2018. And before that date, um, it was a red flag to talk about shutting down um, the whole industry where we have really good um, collective bargaining agreements and shutting down um, well-paid, decent jobs. So it was really hard. Um, um, discussion within trade unions, but we knew also on the other side, if we are not on the menu, we would be on the table. You know, I think it was uh, Annabella Rosenberg was saying this uh, during one COP, and um, I think it's true. So we knew uh, we need to be there and talk to, to, the, to, um, to, to the government, but also to companies because uh, their interests are different from ours. They want to, to maximize their profits and they don't care where they're uh, getting the cash flow from. So um, in the end, um, workers and trade unions are always um, the people who are, uh, have to deal with a mess. So it was our approach to say we need to be um, in front and need to be uh, at um, an early stage in the discussion to really uh, try to, to um, uh, be at the table and to uh, contribute to the discussion. And that's why we were lobbying for this coal commission. And um, we made, I think it was a quite well uh, compre comprehensive um, consensus with uh, three um, main uh, issues. The one is that uh, we don't lose any workers. They all have social security, so they won't get any uh, deduction in pens and wages. So that was very important. On the other hand, we will, uh, um, fulfill our climate targets. So that was also, especially from the environment, a very important issue. And the third thing is that I think that's the main important point is that we lobbied for um, 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 structural funds coming from the government to rebuild um, industries, to rebuild jobs um, in those affected regions uh, to bring something new there. And I think that's the approach you need to convince other people and to convince workers to show uh, there's an opportunity, but it must uh, in, a, in a political it must be in a political framework to um, to really face their their fear for for from the future. So I think it's very important. And I think that's the approach you need to convince other members. And as I said, we are organizing in very um, several sectors. We're also um, organizing in, in public transportation. And I think uh, those sectors uh, will be uh, a winning sector uh, from the uh, transition, but we especially need to convince our members of the traditional um, industries and high intensive um, industries to uh, come on board and to really contribute to the transition. Thank you. And I just want to emphasize what you're saying is you need to move to convince those members from the aspirational to concrete. What I'm hearing, you know, you will not lose your job. You will have social protection or your retirement benefits. Um, this is, I think, one of the key things as we discuss, uh, you know, how do we build our movements? Um, we need to take our really great aspirational frameworks. And in order to talk to workers and move those workers, as Sam says, you know, clinging to jobs during a time of a jobs crisis, here is the plan, <laughs> you know, here's how it's gonna be done, here's the commitment, and here's the resources to do it in Germany, coming from the federal as well as the, the state provincial level. So really important that we go from aspirational to very concrete. Um, I know we're getting um, uh, limited on time. I wanna go to my uh, uh, colleague and sister on the ICAR board, uh, Katie Redford, um, just to kind of start, off, start us off on any reflections and a question. Great, thanks. Um, I think that the, this has been such an incredibly rich conversation, and I think everyone on the panel is, you know, committed to the title, right? Justice and transition. We know that the science demands it, 
and justice demands that it's done in a way that takes care of people. But I really want to focus in because we do have so many labor folks um, and, and certainly it's inspiring to see what, what has happened in Europe. Um, and at the same time, I'm sitting here in the United States and everyone can see exactly what is happening here from an injustice perspective, whether it's racial injustice or economic injustice or every injustice we could we could name it. And I really want to ask the panelists, you know, beyond these notions of justice and just transition, what does it actually look like? And justice for whom? Kaya um, talked about the injustice of these polluting industries who, yeah, we have to protect those jobs, I guess, or jobs for the workers. But at the end of the day, these industries don't care. California alone is, you know, burning at, and, and the industry has been in decline for years. And yet, Governor Newsom, who supposedly is this big climate um, supporter, is issuing one permit after the next, 1,500 new permits this year in California alone to expand the oil and gas industry and the black, brown, indigenous communities who don't have clean water, don't have clean air, don't benefit from these so-called jobs. Um, how do we actually make the rubber hit the road here? Because we can't keep talking about it. We have to do it. Um, you know, we keep saying 10 years, 10 years. By the way, the apocalypse is here right now. We don't have 10 years. So what does it actually look like? And what does the labor movement have to say about making this happen right now? Because that's not what we're seeing on the ground. Great question. Um, obviously, I can jump in, but I want to look to the panelists first. Um, anyone? Jesper? Some, Sam? We'll go. Okay. We're going to do quick rounds here because I know I'm looking at David. This fantastic yeah. question. The urgency of this moment. What are we going to do to build this? Let's go really quick. Jesper, Sam, I don't know, Kea, anybody else? And then I'm happy to say some comments. Go yeah, ahead. It's, it is important that both the employers and the workers uh, are focusing on that it can create uh, growth and jobs for the companies. And, and, and if they can see that uh, the company can see that it can earn money, I'm sure they can also see that it will be a good idea to, to do a little bit more about this one here. As I said earlier, we are exporting most of what we are producing here in Denmark. And we uh, uh, set down a, a, a Danish think tank in, in my union with, where it was CEOs from different companies and organizations focusing on how can we be sure that we still have a, a lot of green jobs in Denmark. Well, green jobs means that it's jobs for windmill bioeconomy and so And it's very important for the employers and uh, the business uh, companies that they can see that they can earn a lot of money because then they, they have, uh, they can uh, satisfy their investors and so on. And also we, what we are doing in, in, in my union is that we have a, a big pension fund where we focusing on in investing on only uh, companies who had a, a, a taking focus on just transition. Thanks. Thanks. And the, the pension fund is another issue we haven't touched on. Sam. Yeah. So I'm going to speak to the U.S. a bit. I feel like I can still do this as a, as a U.S. citizen, someone who's worked a lot in the U.S. Um, so two things. I mean, I think um, I, you know, I'd be the last person to sit here and say I personally or the labor movement has all the answers, especially about the situation in California. Right, so I want to start with that, but I can also say that um, we are actually working on what it would look like to transform jobs, including jobs in the oil and gas sector in California. And then I'm not saying it any more specifically than that because it's too early to say. I would also say that. Um, I, I at least see my like small role in this as a climate activist, a person who's interested in social justice, but also a trade unionist. My role is to support unions and working people in finding solutions 
to the problem that they're in. And the, that solution might not always be something that all of my comrades in the climate movement like, right? But because we're a democratic movement, um, it's got to come from our membership and what our affiliates want. In California specifically, you know, there are there can be a lot of jobs in oil, well, and pipeline remediation and cleanup. Those are jobs that could today employ the you know, very large number of people who are losing their jobs in the oil and gas sector in the state because the oil market globally is going through this big structural change. So that can be one place to start is to like make sure that there is a um, that there are good jobs for people who have just become unemployed from oil and gas so that they now are invested in and supported by a program that is um, that's that has them using their skills to do something else that's also very productive i think the i think the other and um, the more specific issue about communities i lived in richmond when i lived in california so not too far away from the from the refinery and um, as Kea said, the location of polluting industry, and I would also say like polluting transportation, like highways and so on, is spatially and racially and class determined in a lot of countries, right? We have a kind of spatial apartheid in many countries, not only in the US. And so, um, so a, a just, you know, a just resolution of polluting industry would also involve probably some, not an immediate decision, but some, a plan for the region, a plan for jobs, a plan for transforming industry. Um, I understand that people, I understand that people are very suspicious in the US and elsewhere, both of governments and of employers, but in the current economic system, that's also where a lot of the capital and power lies. And our job as trade unionists and as activists is to make them use it in a way that is benefiting everybody. So both people who are working in energy today, people, but also people working in other sectors and people in the community. I mean, I can get more specific than that about what it would look like, but just to say that there are, um, we already see in different countries like New Zealand, which in Denmark and so on, it's possible to convert refineries to hydrogen production. It's possible to convert steel manufacturing to low emission steel manufacturing, which is you know, many fewer particulates for people. It's possible to convert transport, as Jan was talking about, so that instead of pumping out particulates into poor and working class neighborhoods in most of the world's major cities, uh, you would actually have clean transport and abundant and available, safe, um, affordable public transport for people. So, um, so the solutions are there in the U.S. right now. As I mean, I, I'm not going to disagree with what you said, Kea. Like we do need to be united, especially as we're looking towards the election. But we also just have to recognize that we do have conflicts. We will have conflicts. We may never agree on things like existing nuclear CCS. That should not stop us from trying to do the things together that we can do. Like, for example, uh, finding new jobs for people who are unemployed in the oil and gas sector or uh, cleaning up heavily polluted neighborhoods or facilities. Yeah. So, I can't say too much, but I just want to say we are doing stuff on it, and I think you could watch this space. Yeah, and I am looking to David because I only wish we had another half hour because it, this is just, you know, I want to just thank ICAR because one of the reasons we organized this panel was to situate it really in the corporate accountability fights, right? Um, that we can't be thinking about this from a siloed. I mean, these hard, hard questions that Katie's putting forward, these are the ones we need to grapple with. The way capital's been used <laughs> against working people, against the environment, against poor people. I mean, so uh, we clearly see this as being um, key to the work we need to do as the corporate accountability community. 
um, bringing these threads together. That's the power of ICAR. I'm seeing lots of interesting questions come in and I just wanna acknowledge them because we don't have enough time. I see the new, the next panel coming on. Um, I wanna just end if I may, David, um, because we don't have time for questions. Um, one, um, you know, we are happy as the labor movement, I'll speak on behalf of labor and I'm, I'm guessing KO2, we're always happy to have these hard conversations together. That's why we create these spaces. Um, I am so grateful um, that we always can do this, that Kay is always willing to like try to help me figure it out and challenge me and Katie challenge me and Jesper and Jan, the models you're building are help us think about how we might build models. So I wanna thank everybody. I have a slide that we're gonna put up with some additional resources. I wanna end by rem reminding people um, in the corporate accountability movement, you know, this is, this is a space we need to take on. Uh, we need to figure out, you know, we talk about corporate capture. There's no larger corporate capture than this, right? Pitting working people against each other, pitting poor people, people of color. Um, this is part of our agenda. Um, and let's remind each other what we've heard from the panelists. It's about building labor rights. It's a whole of economy approach, making sure workers and the affected communities are at the table. We need political, not market driven solutions. We need investments. We need social protection so people can be healthy and have income support during a crisis. We need to make sure we're dealing with racial justice issues. We need to make sure that we take our aspirational desires and make them real so that all workers can see that they, there's a plan for their lives, that you're not asking them to just jump off a cliff um, and, 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 and have no place to land. So this is the real conversation. We're in it, we're committed to having you know, uh, these tough uh, conversations, but I will say on behalf of the US and global labor movement, we're committed to continuing to build between our movements. It's so critical. I wanna thank Jan and Jesper for the good work that you're doing over there. Thank you, thank you, Sam, as always our resource in the global labor movement. Kea for continuing to have a vision and driving us here in the US. And of course, Katie for uh, pushing us on the, these really important questions and thanks to the whole ICAR community. So um, with that, we'll close out this session and look forward to continuing these uh, important conversations. Over to you, David, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy, uh, and to all the panelists. That was, that was so interesting, and Katie, for your wonderful interventions. I mean, for us at ICAR, uh, as Kathy uh, mentioned in her closing, you know, this is, fundamentally a corporate capture and or sort of corporate accountability uh, challenge where, where, you know, companies, as Katie pointed out, you know, oftentimes they have a different set of metrics that they're focused on. They're focused on quarterly profits and they're focused on uh, how they can, you know, maximize, maximize yield for their shareholders or for, uh, for their owners. And uh, I think if you were able to incorporate the views of workers no worker wants to live in a polluted and destroyed environment, and no worker wants to, um, you know, uh, you know, subject themselves to terrible working conditions and poor wages, or 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 a failure to have a voice in their uh, in their future. And so, there's I think a lot of overlap in space for both the um, you know the, the labor rights movement and the environmental movement to be thinking through, and and us here at ICAR to be. Um, helping to facilitate that where we can, because uh, as Katie said, the the apocalypse is here, and we are, you know, there is a need to um, get this right. But getting it right also means that we can't have, um, as Kathy mentioned, people just jumping off of a cliff and hoping that um, that all the you know pieces will fall um, where they're supposed to. So that's it's a it's a critically important question and a critically important challenge. And at ICAR, um, I know we're you know, there were so many more questions than time for answers. There's no reason we need to be uh, or should be limiting this conversation to our annual meeting. Um, there's there's lots of places and times where we can be um, raising this and continuing this discussion. So um, uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that.